We talked in, in great detail last week about the presumptuous sin of Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10. We'll end uh, with a summary in just a few moments, but there's some questions that we did not hit specifically, and one of them is our question number 10. How do we know by the animal of the sin offering that the events of chapter 10 are tied with the eighth day of consecration of the priest? Uh, we always take, I'll go to Leviticus 10, and we'll look at Nadab and Abihu, but do you understand the context? We, we saw, we talked about in, in pretty good detail the last few verses of chapter 9. What has God done? He sent fire upon the altar where they offered the burnt offering and consumed, consumed the sacrifice. And what did the people do? They fell on their face and they worshiped. I'm putting that in there. They fell on their faces as they shouted. So it was a, a remarkable moment of God receiving. That's how he receives in the Old Testament. I re, I'm receptive of your the fat of your offering, I'm receptive of your offering, and the people shouted, fell on their faces. There was reverence, there was a godly fear, and could that be the problem that Nadab and Abihu went and got their fire somewhere else? I don't know. But it was not commanded, and that was the seriousest things of that. We'll, we'll kind of make a summary of that in a few moments. But connecting it with the eighth day of consecration, look at chapter 9 and verse 1. It came to pass on the eighth day. And that particular day, the priest's sons and the high priest Aaron, they, they have these offerings. They take, the, they take a calf of the herd for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering. We know that's part of the consecration process. Uh, they also, in verse 3, they take a he goat for a sin offering. Chapter 9 and verse 15, he presented the people's oblation. That's the people, and he took the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. He slew it and offered it for sin as the first. What is Moses upset with? And that will be our, our question number 11. But in, question, in chapter 10, and we begin to see it in, in verse 16, Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. Does that tie you in chapter 9? It does to me. There's the goat for the people. It's a day of consecration. There are a lot of other sacrifices being offered, but the priests were to offer that for the people. It's been burnt. So these events just happened so quickly, but it was at a time very close, it was connected. We, we know that the anointing oil is still upon the, the people, in ver, on the priest in verse 7. You should not go from the door of the tent of meeting lest you die, for the anointing oil of Jehovah is upon you. So these events happen, this presumptuous sin that Nabed and Abihu were involved with, it happened on the hills, and things are, are disruptive when all that happened, and God uh, destroys them with fire. But the, the goat of the sin offering for the people has, has been burnt. And so there's that consecration. So we ask the question, with whom was Moses angry and why? Who was he angry with? Aaron? Well, what do we read in verse 16? He sought the goat of the sin offering. Behold, it was burnt, and he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, that were left. So here are the, what do you mean who were left? What's happened? The other two sons have been burnt by God to death. So he's only two left. And why is he angry with them? They hadn't eaten the sacrifice. And notice his arguments that he sets forth here. Wherefore have you not eaten, verse 17, the sin offer in the place of the sanctuary? You priests were to do that. And this little phrase again, that sometimes we don't connect it, when he says it's most holy, that means it belongs to the priest and they're to eat it. 
We think most holy, that just goes straight to God. That that's, that's belongs only to God. Every time you're seeing it, most of the time, I say not every time, but it's most holy, it's most separated and praised unto God that you give it to the priest. And they were supposed to partake of it. He hath given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation. Now that's an interesting phrase and one that just kind of hits you here. So what do you mean bear the iniquity? They were to partake of that sacrifice and to take on bearing, not that the sins are transferred to them, but they're to bear the iniquity as, as and we think about what well, Jesus did that because he paid the price for, for sin. But they were the sense, I'm eating that, I'm taking it away. I'm, it was the, that was the, the picture that's taking place. You bear the iniquity, uh, and, it's, and it's there for the congregation. That's why it's a sin offering for the people. And to make atonement for the congregation before Jehovah. Behold the blood, it was not brought into the sanctuary. That was our little rule we've been looking at. If the blood's brought inside the sanctuary for the altar of incense, uh, then... The sacrifice wasn't taken outside. You were to partake of that. So he has his points there. He's, he's driving home uh, why, why he is angry. It's with Aaron's sons. They're on, the, on that eighth day of consecration, they're involved. It's just not consecrating Aaron. But the sons, are right. they're offering now. Moses, we saw in chapter 9, they're not, Moses isn't offering these offerings. He's been, he's been doing it before. For seven days he's been there on that eighth day when these events take place and they take their fire from a place that's not commanded by God and they haven't eaten the sacrifice. That's what we're dealing with here in the latter part of chapter 10. Those are little details. But that was part of, of the law in which they were to, were, were to fulfill. Did Aaron have a scriptural response? How did Aaron respond? Now you just think, put yourself in Aaron. Your two sons have just been struck dead by God with a fire. And we talked about, it, it, we read in Leviticus 10, that they, I did, they, were, they were consumed or destroyed. Fire came up, upon them. And uh, when that happened, they... they a strange fire offered unto God, and there came fire before Jehovah and devoured them. But when we think about devouring, uh, we may not have left any bones. We just we took everything. We devoured that fish. We devoured that animal. But their bodies were still intact inside their clothes. They take the bodies out with the clothes. It had not annihilated them. Maybe just like a lightning strike struck them dead. But fire... That could be lightning. Fire came down from heaven and destroyed them, took their lives. They have a less well-being than they had before. And uh, there, there's the sense of, of destruction. Well, they, they haven't fulfilled that, that offering's been burnt. He said, where is it? In, in, it? It's been burnt, but where is it? You're supposed to be eating it. They haven't done that. So Aaron is going to to give a, a side a idea of, of, of response unto that. And I'm asking, does he have a scriptural response? Or was it just another form of being sloppy with God's word and neglect and being presumptuous? I'll do what I want to do. First of all, put yourself in his position as he will tell you. What's he feeling at this time? He's in mourning. And, I mean, that's... If you want, that's exactly what he wasn't. Well, they come in and go, you know, you know boys, I, I, I wish they'd done better. But you really have no remorse. No, you have deep mourning. It is hit, this is the point when they, they are being sanctified to be in the uh, a holy relationship with God. And God himself has, has, has destroyed them. It shakes you to your core. It's uh, abrupt. It's uh, something you weren't expecting. Isn't, isn't that when we, we may be in shock at first, but there is the mourning that is taking place as, as well. And Aaron responds that way. Let's just see what he says. And Aaron spake in verse 19, Behold this day 
have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before Jehovah. And there have befallen me such things as these. If I had eaten the sin offering, would it have been well-pleasing in the sight of Jehovah? Now you can have a law that says thou shalt not work on the Sabbath day, and you find a file of picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, and you bring them to the authorities and say, what should we do with it? Well, the law said you're not supposed to do that. Ought to be, be the death penalty. But the idea is sometimes there's a condition. He was just picking up sticks. Uh, is that violating the, the Sabbath? And Moses, what was his command? You know, we'll, we'll stone him to death. He's put to death. He's violated the Sabbath. And so you may know that you've done a terrible thing and you know what the judgment is. You've already seen it. But he's asking the question, would I have done well in this state of mourning to partake of that sin offering? That's the, that's the situation that it was. And, and, and I'm asking, is it a scriptural response? And if you look at the outline, I think it is. In another context, in another situation, but it's the idea of offering sacrifices. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 26 and verse 14. Deuteronomy 26 and verse 14. The three years of tithing has ended. Sacrifices and things are being dedicated unto God. And we'll find in... Starting with 13. And thou shalt say before Jehovah God, I put away the hallowed things out of my house, and also have given them unto the Levites. So I'm tithing. They're holy. In fact, we know they're most holy. They go to, they go to honor God and, and take care of the needs of the priest, the Levite. And unto the sojourner and to the fatherless and the widow, as which they would be helped with their tithings as well. According to all thy commandments thou hast commanded me, I have not transgressed any of thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. I have not eaten therefore in my what? In my morning. I put away their, their own, neither have I put away their own being unclean. I was clean when I partook of it, I, and I, but I'm not in mourning when I've eating, eaten that, and are, are given for the dead. They, there was a, well, let's just look at Jeremiah. There, there was a, a partaking of a dinner for the dead. And it was a, a, a practice among the, the people. The idea of, of, of drinking uh, a cup of consolation for the death of a, of a father and, uh, and, a, and a mother that, that one might have. Uh, Jeremiah 16 and verse 7. Verse 6 says, Both great and small shall die in this land. The idea there's not going to be any mercies of God. The, the, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, and Jeremiah's talking about the judgment to come. They shall not be buried. They're not even going to be dignified with a burial. Neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, or make themselves bald for them. Neither shall men break bread for them in mourning to comfort for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for the father and for their mother. So there's drinking, to, eating the bread of men. Drinking the cup of consolation, honoring the dead, being consoled because what's happened? My mother and father have died. And they'll be dying. You won't be having that. You won't give the dignity to the situation of, of a death on these, this particular occasion. But the point is, is that in mourning, a lot of times, there would be that natural thing that most people would do. But here was the occasion when they're partaking of the sacrifices. They have, that's going to be something that was to be done without mourning. That was praise. So you should, you know, it's, you read, read Nehemiah 8, and they were counting the days. They were, they, were, they were worshiping and remembering feast days in connection with Babylonians' captivity. And they were not happy. And yet it was the Feast of Tabernacles that they were supposed to be taken. That was harvest time. They should have been very happy. 
And he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what the prophets would tell them. They were to take it joy. They were to offer their sacrifices in joy. Aaron's making that argument. And from the idea of scripture, it wasn't just dreaming it up. Give me a break, Moses. You just lost your nephews. I lost my sons. I'm shaken because this God is behind it. I'm sorry I didn't partake of the burnt offering. Get off my back. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. That's what some of us would do. Get off my back. I'm tired of your regulations. But he had a scriptural response. And why do you think Moses was well pleased with Aaron in his response? He just backed down. And we're just, God doesn't have a, his word doesn't have any weight at all. No. There was a consequence, there was a situation that was okay. And that's how it ends. 20 verses, chapter 10 uh, of, this, of this event, that's all we have. But it is enough to teach us some things that I think are very, are very helpful. Now, I'm asking, this is where we're going to sum up real quickly. We won't go into a lot of detail because I think, I think you are well established in this. But I want us to see that of steps we take, we sometimes jump over them, but we end up the same place. But I want to take those necessary steps when we talk about being presumptuous, that there's something connected with when we use Nadab and Abihu as examples. So does it have... Does their sin have any proper application for day as Christians? And we will just cut to the chase. Yeah, what about instrumental music? Where do you find instrumental music condemned in the New Testament? You won't. You just don't find it commanded. There's the illustration power. They offered up fire that was not commanded. But that doesn't mean that it's in a context that God never commanded about fire. <laughs> it is said, well, it is, you know, it's ideal. It, it's not saying that, that you, you have to do it this way, but there was a place where you got it. Now, when you have a, a command to do that, that's what you follow. But when we say that excludes everything else because he has not commanded that, I think we need to remind ourselves just because that we have a command to do it one way, does that necessarily exclude everything else? And that's where you'll get in trouble with truth. Why aren't we taking the Lord's Supper in the upper room? Every time you see it partaken of and give specifics, they're in the upper room. Well, well, you got another passage that freed it up. Worship is not re registered to place. It's not in Jerusalem. It's not in this mount. It's we worship in spirit and in truth. And so we see that all, all and, and this, is, this is honoring. This is what makes God's silence so powerful in this argument, in this illustration. It's because we presume this would be all right. Didn't mean God had not commanded what he likes. But that's the only, only one way. We, we don't have a commandment against it. And we have a commandment that just specifies. When you specify something, that doesn't mean it excludes everything else. That means something you want. But God's silence makes it powerful that we will now take the step to exclude everything else. Because we will not trample on the silence of God. I want us to be very accurate with Scripture and the application of Scripture that we'll realize I'm not going to make an argument that, well, that excludes everything. We, 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 I've seen debates. You put a big circle out here and you, you have uh, instrumental, instrumental music. You know, you, you'll have, you have all eight times of which the, it's vocal music in the New Testament. Eight or nine times. And that's, so, that's what he, he has, has specified. And, right, well, he didn't say you couldn't do it, and all that sort of thing. But the idea is that that excludes 
everything else. That's the next step. Well, the next step is, no, that just it included. I want the person to include in that where I found all of my authority, I want them to put the passage for instrumental music. I want them to affirm the authority of God. Whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. How do you do that with scripture and, and say, well, it's okay. We, we, we shortcut it and we do not allow the person to see. You need to have authority for what you practice. And there's other circumstances, there's other passages that open that up. That's different. Well, that's, that's the strength of standing where you do, when you do that way. But when you say, well, here it is, he specifies this, it came, it came from the altar, and that excluded everything else. In a way it did. <laughs> I'm not arguing or, or putting that idea down. But the power of the silence, of reverencing the silence, he did not command it. He had no authority for it from God's command to take it from that other place. It was from the burnt offering. And whether he was frightful because of what just happened at that burnt offering, God making himself known, but he sure did make himself known day to by you just a few moments later, how long that was. And so... In the end, yes, what we read in Ephesians 5, 19, that excludes everything else. And we have just short-skirted something that I think is very important. And Hebrews 7 makes the whole argument on God's silence. And I want to reverence that. That's why Nadab and Abihu is such an important example. And yes, I do believe it has application for Christians today. In the end, because you don't have the positive command for it, and you're contradicting what he has commanded, because you're not doing it his way, your thing is excluded. But we don't usually do it that way. We just say, hey... We, that excludes everything else, and we don't have a Bible study over it. And we may, you may not need it. You may be smart enough to understand all that, but not, not everybody understands that. And then you're going to be doing, well, it didn't say not to, and you're going to chase that rabbit, and that, that's a rabbit worthy to chase. But what a wonderful thing to be establishing in connection with what he has commanded. It's what, it, what he had not commanded. There's the silence. You don't do things based upon the silence. And that's what they did. That's the presumptuousness. That's why presumptuous study is important with Nadab and Abihu. I hope that, oh, that makes sense to you. But that, that's kind of summing up what happened that day. And Aaron did have a scriptural response, which was connected with deep mourning. And that sort of, if, if they'd have touched a dead body, you know, he had... Uh, had his, had his, what, his nephews? No, his first cousins. Moses had Aaron's first cousins to take the body out. So it wasn't an immediate family situation there. Even those of, of the tribe of Kohath. But all those things, and you, you, to touch the dead, you would be unclean. You were not, you're not to be taking sacrifices that way. We just read that sort of thing. But in times of mourning, that was also what Aaron emphasized. Any, any questions on uh, lesson six? Uh, chapter 10. Yes, sir. And that, and that was the other uh, question. People could mourn for half a time for mourning for that, but the priest could not. And your point, 
Not only was there to be holy, but they were to sanctify me before the people of God. And God had brought punishment upon uh, Aaron's household, in particular his sons who were guilty of the sin. And there was a sense of why maybe uh, they weren't uh, allowed to do that because here was an immediate family. They're not going to mourn because they would say, well, God, you've been unjust. The people might be thinking, God, you've been unjust. And they were not to allow that to be interpreted at all. They're not going to mourn for it. And yet they were. It was, it was a time for mourning. It had been very difficult to eat with that, even though we're not going to let our hair loose and all that. My heart's hurting. My heart is mourning. Would that have been okay if I, inside my heart when I didn't show outward signs to be able to take, to take the sacrifice, uh, which you have commanded? So sanctifying them among the people, that's what, that's what Moses did in the, in the end. When, when he's, he is... Uh, you know, told to speak to the rock. You sanctify me before the people. And he struck it. He was mad. He spoke ill-advisedly, the psalmist says. And uh, that was all part of the consequences of this dis disobedience. But they had a particular place of, of being holy. And uh, he, they violated that, that connection with God. And God let it be known that he was displeased with them. And... Uh, what a what an example in the Bible, but I think it I think it can be used as an example instrument of music it comes to my mind. That's what we're looking at. All right, let's let's get ourselves ready. You're going to have lunch today. You got any dietary restrictions besides salt and carbs and can you have pork tenderloin filet mignon? You have, are, are, are you restricted food? Maybe your health will not allow you to do that. But as far as uh, serving God, are you worried about that? <laughs> well, that's nasty. Well, I like it. Well, who's going who's to be the determiner on, on that? But in this section that we're looking at in Leviticus, beginning in Leviticus 11, it will take us through chapter 15 of how we're going to determine people to be uh, clean or unclean, and there were dietary restrictions. There were things that indeed were set forth as being unclean, and there were meats that they, they could be considered clean. And in this 11th chapter, we get involved with that. So if you don't want to go through that process, I don't want you to leave, and I want you to pay attention yeah, pay attention, you might learn something. And you, uh, you might help us know what all these animals are, since you're so smart. Now, I'm just playing with you. I just, I'm kidding you. But when we see these, we, we kind of look, what, what's the criteria? What is the criteria? There's more than one standard. Determined edible food for the Israelites in the following animal groups. Four-footed animals. There's your cow. There's your pig. And uh, those are two things that come to, to mind. I, th I think I'll have lizard today. Okay. Yeah, he does have four feet, doesn't he? But I won't have a caterpillar. But he has more than four feet. So you have, you have a standard. So on the four-footed animals, what is indeed the standard? Yes, sir. Okay. Does a cloven foot uh, make the foot separated? And I think, look, look at verse, verse 3. Those thoughts are there. Whatever parteth the hoof, separated, and is cloven footed, tracking that big buck. Yeah, I can eat him. And cheweth the what? The could. What does your Bible say? My, my Bible will face fashion now. I know what the Hebrew means. It means scratch the throat. Does that help you? Take it out of that first stomach. I took it up to my throat and I scratched the throat and I'll eat it again. Chewing the could. And he said, among the beasts, you may eat that. So I'm looking at the feet of those animals. They may be four foot. It may be good to eat, but... Uh, 
I've got to I've got to think about did they chew the could and could it be well they part their hoof they're cloven footed but they don't chew the could could I eat that I got one of them right both of them have to be in place don't they both of them have to be in place so that's that one what about fish Wow, well, you're, you're, you're good, okay. That'd be a good illustration. Who needs they down to buy you? You got, to, you got other things that are connected. No, that's true. And, and that's true, you find that anywhere. And, you know, it includes both of them, doesn't it? Then say are. It says and, and I think that's good. Both of those have to be good. And that's, I thank you for explaining that, because that's better than what I did. All right, what about the fish? What, what's, uh, if they're in the, in the waters... What's going to have to be done? What does verse 9 say? Whatever have fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, so your salt water and freshwater fishing problems solved, <laughs> and the rivers that ye may eat. So we got those in our mind. We got those in place. So here we go. I tell you, I've been riding that camel all over this place. I am sick and tired. I'm hungry. He looks pretty good to eat. And you say, that's nasty. It's like eating a dog. No. Apparently, you could, you could do that. That would be a possibility that's take, that has taken place. And so you begin to, to look at these animals in verse 4. Why could you not eat the camel, he chews the could. Have you looked at his hoof? It looks like a horse. It's just solid. It doesn't, it doesn't part the hoof. So camel is unclean. Dog is eaten by people. Some people like dog. Some people like camel. But the Jewish people were not going to partake of, of that animal. And we think about dietary things and I mean, uh, health wise. And we'll see that in the latter part of chapter 11 that you might make that point. But right now we're just some what makes it unclean uh, to eat it. Therefore, we be unclean before God. It doesn't mean I'll be healthier if I stay away from camels. Maybe it may be a blessing, all this, but that was not the criteria. This is healthy for you. This is not. But what about a rabbit? Does a, does a, 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 what does a, what does a rabbit do? And it says here, verse six, and the hair, because she cheweth the could, but parteth not the hoof. I got a rabbit's foot on my leather jacket. And uh, then part the hoof. Got a little pad, you know, that, that's, that's a rabbit. But this hair chews the cud, and that rabbit that you're thinking about doesn't chew the cud. Rabbits don't do that. So you're looking at animals that once existed that has names that we would connect, hare and rabbit, <laughs> H-A-R-E. And a lot of these animals, probably extinct but at the time, they were there. We would see the coney. That's a, that's, that's a rock badger. He cheweth the cud, but he parts not the hoof. It's unclean. The hare. And then what? So the, the rabbit we'd have today, that would be unclean to eat. What about pork? We got that one down, don't we? Swine. I mean, still Orthodox Jews, you know, there we, here we are. But verse 7, the swine, he has a cloven foot. I just see it all the time in that mud pen he's in. But he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean unto you. Of their flesh ye shall not eat, their carcasses ye shall not touch. They are unclean unto you. That's what we're looking at. 
Okay, I'm going to go to cities and I'm going to get some catfish. Now, I'm staying away from that port, but I want the catfish today and I'll bring Jerry's bulletin and I'll get 10% off. And I want catfish. Well, if you were a Jew, could you do that? Why? It doesn't have scales, does it? Does it have fins? We got half of it, right? But it doesn't have scales. And you say, well, oh, Mac, they are, they are bottom feeders. They're unclean. That, that's just health. That's good health reasons. Thank you. Well, that's not the point. It may be true, may be not true, but the, the point is, is that that was not going to be something that, that you, could, uh, you could eat. All right. Oysters. Oh, yuck. I would say, yeah, I want, them, I want them raw. Half shell, please. I want a dozen of them on the half shell. I'll take six today. I'm cutting back. And... Why would they not be able to be eaten? A little ketchup on a saltine cracker, they go down good. Well, they have any scales? I don't know if they have fins or not, but I haven't seen that. But they, they'd miss on both counts as far as I'm concerned. And that would be something I could not have. Could I have a flounder? I didn't put that one in here. Application. Oh, flounder. That's pretty good. Did you have a flounder? If you go to HEB, you might wonder about it because they'll have it already scaled for you. But they have scales, don't they? They could be eaten, and they have fins. So that would be something that you would have to make that decision based upon the standard, the rules that are going by. And I have a feeling they'll be just hitting that. It won't be because that's yucky, yucky, daddy. I don't want to eat that anyway. It would be because it's based upon... Uh, the law that we have. And then we get to these flying birds. Am I asking the question, could you eat a duck? In my experience, that, that's, that's tasted pretty good. And, and in my experience, that's tasted pretty bad. Depends how you fix it. And I don't know how to fix it. So it, it tastes pretty bad, but people do. Kathy yeah, prepares things like that real well. But when you look at that and you begin to, well, I'll, I'll, these birds, do those ducks fly? They yeah, you fly in, it's why you shot them, <laughs> they come in. But look at these birds that are listed, and there's 20 of them. And I'm, I'm not going to go through every one of them because a lot of them are, are kind of, closely connected with each other. You have uh, the, the, the eagle, the our eagle. You have, you have owls of different species, I mean, different types of owls. But there's 20 of them. And when you sum up these birds, I hope you, you did this, when you sum all of those uh, birds, birds up, what, could, what general point, since a lot of them are extinct, or some of them are extinct, because uh, they just don't know how, how to identify them. Some of them are, we still see around. What would be the general, because it just says these are, these are unclean, these are unclean, these are unclean. What do you, what's implied there, what's inferred there, or not, what's implied that we can infer from this that might give us some guidelines? Danny? Well, they eat meat, they're, they might be they're vultures, the, and, and they are, they're swift, and they attack, and that's the idea, they're, they're, they're eating the, the meat, the eagle, uh, the night hawk, you, you have the raven, raven the, the dark raven, and so we ask the question, could you eat a crow? Yes. Well, 
Well, that's meat, and that's that's right. We see the the vulture, the the buzzard, right? And the raven is from what the crow is from the raven is from the family of crows. So I wouldn't eat a crow. Wouldn't want to. But the idea here, some of your versions have some of these have the raven. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they eat on meat. Sometimes it is dead meat and so forth. <clears throat> and they're, they're, they're set forth that way as, as being that which we'd probably stay away from, even though some of them might be something that we'd like. What about the seagull? And some of the virgins have sea mew. mew. What about the cormorant? I saw one in the park, in, in the water, go down and get a catfish. Guys around there trying to fish, and this, this bird, that's what he was, he's black, and he brought up that catfish. They're attackers, they're going after uh, meat like that as being a, attacking type birds, vultures and that sort of thing, where that was gonna be unclean. And we, we may wanna go more detail about that, but when you look at those 20, just kind of sum up, from, from what we have, because they're, they're mentioned here, and we're, what is a, what is a hoopoo? That'd be a good assignment. We'll, we'll figure that one out next time. But those are some of the birds, and we'll, we'll continue on with uh, Lesson 7. Thank you.